for it because she was so young. So that was kind of fun. That's so, really fun. Yeah. That was wonderful two years in New Jersey and then a wonderful visit, but I haven't been back since. So. Well, I haven't been out to California in practically forever. I don't know. I, I don't know the last time that I was actually on the West Coast. So, but my sister lives in Seattle, so I should make it out there. So. Yeah, you should. Well, I marvel at the fact that New Jersey is sort of like a small inverted California, you know, on opposite ends of the country. They look very similar in terms of shape. And so I felt right <laughs> at home when I was there. So <laughs> <laughs> it's true, kind of a collapsed California. Right. Right. <laughs> Are, well, you at home? are you at home, Leo? Where are you? Okay. I am. I'm at home. Things have changed in the decor. In the decor. Yeah, it'll look different. I think next time you she never, time she you never invites her dad to Tucson. That's, That's the not story. true. <laughs> Whenever I'm about to come, she she is. She goes, no, I'm on my way. I'm coming out. So she comes to California. So I'm. She's up on me by a number of visits. I need to get caught up. So yeah, you need to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I guess I should let people in. Um, yeah, that's there's good. Two, uh, three other people here. So, okay. um, is that okay? Yes, by all means. Okay. And we have an iPhone. Candy and Amaya are both um, welcome. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Say hello. hello. Um, feel free to to put your face up here. It's not a huge it's not a huge crowd, so it would be nice if we could see you, even if you're you know in the kitchen or something. Okay. <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> Wait, how do I? Oh, there it goes. <laughs> there you oh, are. Candy. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a few people coming in, kind of filtering. That's good. It's it's good to see everybody. Amaya, you too. <laughs> it's good to it's it's good to sort of see you. Okay, one second. <laughs> it's a Zoom life these days. It's crazy. There's Laura. And my colleague Mary is here too. Welcome. Hello. Mary. Great, we're just filtering in here. And I was telling um, Professor Wolf that, uh, that we're a, kind of like a small liberal arts college in many ways, although the university itself is pretty large, Montclair, but, um, and Mary knows more about this actually than I do. Yeah, we have a, a, um, a relatively large college of arts, uh, of humanities and uh, social sciences. Yeah. It's, um, it's a great place, actually. Um, so welcome everyone to Salvaging Convivencia as a historical subject. Um, this is um, a course lecture that's connected with Humanities 202 and a lecture and discussion with um, Professor Kenneth Baxter Wolf, who is John Sutton Minor Professor of History and Classics at Pomona College. So we're very lucky to, to be able to connect up this way by Zoom because he's uh, three hours behind us there in, in time. And um, uh, convivencia refers to the coexistence of, I'm just going to read out what the, uh, 
what the blurb is. Um, Convivencia refers to the coexistence of Christian, Muslim, and Jewish communities in medieval Spain, and by extension, the cultural interaction and exchange fostered by such proximity. Um, it has received a great deal of attention by 21st century scholars, some of whom have thought of Al-Andalus, Islamic Spain, as a kind of medieval laboratory of modern multiculturalism. But did convivencia, that is like the, the co-living of Christian, Muslim, and Jewish communities, did convivencia really exist in the way its modern admirers imagine? What was the historical basis for tolerance of difference or for culture and for cultural exchange in medieval Liberia? Um, so I want to introduce Professor Wolf. He's a historian of mentality who mines medieval Latin texts in an effort to reconstruct the mindsets and worldviews of their authors and imagined audiences. And uh, he recently finished a translation and study of the writings of Eulogius of Cordoba, the main source for the so-called Cordoban martyrs movement of the 850s, which was totally new to me, I've got to say, uh, Liverpool University Press 2019. And he's currently at work on a companion volume. His work divides between Christians living under Islamic rule and how they managed that reality and medieval Christian sanctity um, is another topic he's very interested in. We're recording this session um, just so that people know. And, um, and with that, I guess uh, I'll just pass it to you, Professor Wolf to say hello. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Fogel. This is really a wonderful opportunity. Um, I, uh, I get the opportunity to give talks on this subject and versions of this subject, sometimes in classes, sometimes in conferences, and, uh, and to have somebody reach out across the country and say, hey, I'm doing this class and, and this might work. Would you like to do it? Um, I just think that's, that's wonderful. Um, so with me halfway imagining the course that you are all involved in, but also probably more importantly, um, kind of forcing what I know into the fit of your course. Um, excuse me for things that that might be new or things that might be might be strange, but I think I think I can do it in a short period of time in a way that will leave you with with something that you might not have had before. Um, so um, so that that's my hope anyway. So when I was young, people in my generation anyway, we all learned that clumsy little verse, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Um, when we think about 1492, which is near the beginning of your humanities semester, uh, the second chunk that you're all involved in, when we think about 1492 through, 92, through the whole Columbus thing, um, traditionally, we imagine that as being really the end of the Middle Ages, right? The beginning of the modern world, right? Back then, when I was singing that little ditty, I had no idea that there were other things going on in 1492 as well, right? The surrender of Granada, the last of the Muslim cities under Muslim control anyway in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain, um, that was surrendered on the 2nd of January that same year. And then three months later, um, the Jews were expelled uh, from, from Spain. And that happened uh, right in the, middle, in the middle of August, really, pretty much the time that Columbus was taking off. Um, they'd been told they had to leave by uh, July 31st, and they were given a couple of weeks extra to pack their things, which was, uh, you know, a, a small consolation. But, and then, of course, 10 years later, or nine years later, the Muslims were expelled too, right? So when we think about 1492, we think about Columbus, but we also think about the surrender of Granada. We think about the expulsion of the Jews by extension, the, the 10 year later expulsion of the Muslims. The significance of that, traditionally, people have regarded as the end of convivencia. That is kind of the beginning of enforced Catholicism essentially throughout Spain. It turns out that both of these ends and beginnings are, are oversimplifications, right? You probably already realize with Columbus um, that you know, in some sense, people say it's the end of the Middle Ages, beginning of the modern world, but Columbus may have unlocked European access to the Americas, but his mindset, his motivations, his sense of geography, especially were purely medieval, uh, something that we talk about a lot in my classes. He's very much a medieval person who happened to do something that, that opened up the world to, to kind of global trade, the first globalism in a sense, if you're thinking about the, uh, the Atlantic. 
Um, but with regard to the latter, that is the idea that 1492 is the end of convivencia, it's a different correction that I would make. And that's, that is simply one where I would ask whether convivencia ever really existed. Um, and I'm, I'm going to problematize it and suggest that it probably didn't exist in the way that we would like to think it existed. Um, and that's really what I'm going to do today. I'm not going to talk about Columbus so much. I'm going to talk about the idea of convivencia, um, where it came from, how it evolved, and the limited extent to which the whole idea is actually grounded in data that we can use. Okay. So what is what is convivencia? Um, it's so many different things that it's probably best to start with a bestseller that came out in the year 2002 um, by Maria Rosa Menocal, a Cuban-born scholar uh, and a, a professor of literature at Yale um, who died way too young at 59, um, not, not that long ago. She wrote a book called The Ornament of the World, and the subtitle of that book is this, How Muslims, Jews, and Christians Created a Culture of Tolerance in Medieval Spain. That's a very loaded subtitle in a way, and it's meant to get you to buy the book, right? Um, uh, she was a very sophisticated scholar, but she also understood that there's an importance in getting big ideas out to people who aren't scholars, right? So it's the kind of book you might find in Barnes and Noble and pick it up and buy it on an impulse in, you know, Atlanta when you're waiting for the next plane and, and read this book and go, wow. And, and I just want to point out that it's based on, on huge knowledge of the subject, but it's also written with a particular point in mind, right? Her thesis statement is interesting. It says, uh, and I've kind of chopped this up a bit. This was the chapter of Europe's culture when Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived side by side, and despite their intractable differences and enduring hostilities, nourished a complex culture of tolerance. This only sometimes included guarantees of religious freedoms comparable to those we would expect in a modern tolerant state. Rather, it found expression in the often unconscious acceptance that contradictions within oneself as well as within one's culture could be positive and productive. So it's interesting in that very statement, right? The word tolerance, which is the biggest word in that subtitle, she in some ways unpacks and backs away from almost immediately. You know, we're not really talking about tolerance the way we're thinking about it. We're talking about tolerance in, as she says, an often unconscious acceptance that contradictions are okay and sometimes positive, okay? Which is, when you think of tolerance, normally normally you think about it as an attitude, as something that you, you are a tolerant person and you approach the world tolerantly. But notice the unconscious acceptance of contradiction. That's a very specific definition of, of tolerance. So Menocal's thesis, there's four parts, okay, that involve her understanding of the history of where um, this special period of the history of Spain really fits in the broader world. She talks, first of all, about the Umayyad Caliphate, which is the first of the caliphates um, in Damascus that emerges in the wake of the expansion period of Islam, right? While the expansion is still going on, in fact. And she claims that that caliphate was characterized, as she said, by a willingness to entertain cultural differences and contradictions within its court and within its realm. The examples she gives are interesting. One is, and this is very close to her heart because she she's very interested in the way that, that Arabic as a language in Spain might have influenced the emergence of troubadour poetry in Southern France. That was one of her real, one of her real dissertation focuses in her first book. But anyway, the idea that Muslims would retain pre-Islamic Arab literary culture. In other words, that a Muslim wouldn't be bothered by what you might consider to be pagan stories from the pre-Islamic past, she said that's a sign of openness. And indeed, Muslims forever have appreciated great pro poetry from the pre-Islamic period, right? The other point that she, that she made was that when uh, the Umayyad Caliphate expanded and controlled so much territory within the Mediterranean basin, they granted communal autonomy to all of the Christians and the Jews and others, Zoroastrians, for instance, that they encountered and allowed them to live as essentially um, independently governed peoples under the aegis of Islam. They considered them peoples of the book, that is people that had received a revelation similar but different than the one that Muhammad re received from the Quran, similar in inspiration, but then ultimately corrupted from their perspective, right? That's what record, meant that Muhammad had to come with a new revelation. But the idea was that there was enough respect for Christians and Jews in this tradition to allow them to continue to do what they were doing. 
and the Christians throughout most of this area were the majority population. So there's a certain amount of, of um, um, you know, realpolitik going on here. Could they really, say, force the Christians to convert to Islam, et cetera? Were there enough Muslims to do that? So for whatever reason, there was a certain kind of tolerance of Christian and Muslim and, and Jewish communities living under Islam. So that's the broader Umayyad Caliphate context for her argument. The thing about the Umayyad Caliphate was, though, that um, in the year 750, there was a revolution and all of the Umayyads, everybody related to that family, they were executed, except for one who escaped and made his way all the way across the Mediterranean. And six years later, in 756, he turns up in Cordoba, Abdurrahman I. And there he establishes a new Umayyad caliphate in exile in Cordoba. And her argument is that he, establishing that caliphate, all of his successors, okay, from 756 to 1031, and then beyond the immediate successor state uh, to his that would last until, until, or the states that would last until 1085, that each of these were characterized by a similar kind of openness that way, a kind of a tolerance. Um, leading to a number of really significant, what I call, convivencia moments that basically form the core of each of Menachal's chapters. So for instance, one of her chapters focuses on something near and dear to my heart. That is the Cordoban Christians living under Muslim rule, okay, but being drawn to Arabic as a language instead of Latin, which was the language that they were supposed to be drawn to if they became, if they entered into, you know, kind of the intellectual world. And so one character, a Christian by the name of Paul Alvarez, one of whose treatises I just finished translating, it's my newest book, um, he actually laments, and he writes this down, that, that all of the Christians who normally would be growing up and learning Latin, what are they doing? But they're turning around and they're de dedicating themselves to Arabic. From Menachal's perspective, this is a very positive thing. It isn't, by the way, from Paul Alvarez's perspective, because he thinks that's the end of the Christian community if all of the young Christians are not interested in Latin anymore in their heritage, but go to, to, to Arabic things. Even if they're still Christians and working in Arabic, he thinks they're going to be tempted to become to convert to Islam. And so he's upset about it, but Menachal is not. Menachal looks at this as a real moment of convivencia. That is where Christians and Muslims in Cordoba are living together, and what are the Christians doing, but they're attracted to Islamic culture, or at least Arabic culture, enough to begin to take on its trappings. They dress like Muslims, they begin to talk like Muslims, they give up Latin for Arabic, etc. The second of these convivencia movements happens um, at the peak of the Umayyad Caliphate in Cordoba under the greatest of their rulers, Abdurrahman III, okay? And that's when a Jewish physician by the name of Hastai ibn Shafrut, um, from Chayen, which is a town in southern Spain, great olive production town to this very day, he rose to serve as vizier under Abdurrahman III. And for a Jew to, to rise to that position was significant. And so all of the things that he did for Abdurrahman III and all the things that he did for the Jewish community to protect them, et cetera, going so far as to reach out to other Jews in the region to try to make contact with them, all of this looks like a convivencia moment. Of course, there were plenty of people grumbling in Abdurrahman's administration. Why in the world are you relying on a Jew? Why are you not relying on Muslims? And he had to defend, defend his choice. A century later, and the third example, um, that's an important one for Menokal, is Samuel Hanagid, another Jew, a Kordoman-born Jew, who ends up being a minister to the the Muslim king of Granada at the time, kind of a, a, a city-state because the Umayyad empire by then uh, in Spain is broken up. But this particular character, Samuel Hanagid, is one of the greatest poets in all of Jewish history, um, actually served not only as vizier the way that Hastay ibn Shafrut had in his generation, but he actually led Muslim armies into battle against rival Muslim kings in Spain. That's a, a super remarkable thing when you think about it, to have a Jew actually involved in leading armies, and then to have him sit down and write poetry about it, because he is such a great poet. He referred to himself as the David of his own age. In other words, as a Jew, he looked to King David of Israel centuries and centuries before, and saw him as a great commander leading Jewish 
troops, Israel, Israeli, Israeli, Israelite troops against their enemies, but at the same time writing poetry about it that's come down to us in the form of the Psalms. And so someone like Samuel Halagid saying, I am the David of my age, he's saying a lot. He's saying, I am a leader of armies and I'm writing poetry about it. The odd thing is that, that the God that he's crediting with his victories is not helping the Jews reclaim the promised land. He's helping the Muslims beat their enemies in Spain. So that's a, a wild and very interesting point of, as we say, convivencia. Now, this chapter in Spanish history is sandwiched in between, from Menachal's perspective, two other chapters in Spanish history that are considered much more intolerant of difference. The, the before picture are the peoples, the quote-unquote barbarian Visigoths who lived in Spain before the Muslims conquered it, before 711. They had uh, developed a unified Catholic kingdom, and part of that was issuing very harsh anti-Jewish measures, almost as if they wanted to convert the Jews to Christianity, which was something that that is, that is rare, but happens on different parts of the Mediterranean in this period. That's the before picture. And then after the Umayyad period in Spain with all of these convivencia moments, and after the so-called Taifa period, that is the city-states period that for another 50 years or so lasts after the fall of the Umayyads, that's when, as Menokal sees it, the fanaticism of the Moroccan dynasties come in, two dynasties invading from Morocco, um, the Almoravids and the Almohads in succession come in and they reunify southern Spain, and she sees that as the end of convivencia in that context. And then, of course, when the Christians come and reconquer Muslim Spain and create a unified Christian Spain under Ferdinand and Isabella, that's, of course, when Granada falls, when the Jews are kicked out, when Columbus is sent, etc. That's also an effort to create a unified Catholic Spain, and therefore, it's not a time of convivencia. It's a time when the Muslims, when the Christians and the Muslims are really under the gun and the Christians are back in power again, right? That's basically Menel Call's thesis in a nutshell, okay? I haven't, I haven't done it in any great detail. I'm just giving you a few examples to give you the idea. Menel Call didn't invent the idea of convivencia, though. She is just the most popular exponent of the American version of this particular concept. It really started with Américo Castro, um, C-A-S-T-R-O, as you can see on your handouts if you have them, um, he used it, that concept of convivencia, he essentially coined it, although he borrowed it from, a, from a, another literary scholar from a previous generation, but he used it to challenge the dominant paradigm that was used at that time to understand the Spanish Middle Ages. Now, this traditional view was represented by a guy by the name of, I mean, many, by the way, but Claudio Sanchez Albernov, a complicated last name, but he wrote um, a short uh, thing in 1929 called España y el Islam, España, uh, Spain and Islam. I actually, it's unavailable in English, so I translated it and I gave you a link that you can, you can read it if you want to. It's quite interesting. We use it in my medieval Spain class. Anyway, his goal, writing in 1929, when Spain was kind of hopelessly behind the rest of Europe in so many ways, at least by their own estimation, he was trying to explain why that should be the case. Now, this kind of history where you're looking at your own past to explain your particular present is more of what we call a civics lesson than a history. In other words, you're looking for meaning in the past rather than just trying to understand what happened in the past. So you typically end up telling a very oversimplified, one-sided story about the past to make sense out of something that you believe is important in the present. So if you're on top of the world and you're conquering everybody, you might write in the past about, about a rags to riches story, how you, how you came out of nothing and you dominated the world. That would be more of a story than a history when you get right down to it. And the opposite too, when you're not doing as well as you used to, you might write a history telling a story about why it is that you're not doing as well. And you might oversimplify that too. It's basically what we call retrojection, where you take what you are now and what's important to you now, and you throw it back onto the past and essentially emphasize those things in the past that will make sense out of that um, as, you, as you go forward. So anyway, most Spanish historians of the time, when they're trying to explain why Spain was lagging in the early 20th century and late 19th for that matter, they saw Islam as the most likely culprit, okay? And it kind of makes sense if you're just looking for somebody to blame because Spain was the only Western European country that fell to Islam in that initial expansion period. 
and because at the time these Spaniards are writing in the early 20th century, colonized Middle Eastern countries, okay, seemed from their perspective, hopelessly backward when compared to the cultures of the European colonizers, right? And you've probably all studied things to know what it's like when you have the colonizer and the colonized and what happens when the colonizer looks at the colonized. You may have read some Edward Said and Orientalism, et cetera, that all plays into this, okay? Um, so there's a latent, maybe not so latent, anti-Semitism to all of this, right? Mostly we think of anti-Semitism as anti-Jewish. Anti but, but the Semitic peoples include Muslims as well. And this was a very ecumenical form of anti-Semitism because people like Sanchez Alberno writing about Spanish history that way had nothing good really to say about Jewish or Islamic involvement in Spanish history because his point was that Spain should be Christian, that Spain and the, under the time of the Romans, when it was Christianized during the Roman Empire, and then the Visigothic barbarians who took over, they were Christianized as well. And back then, let's say before the year 711, when the Muslims arrived, they were in perfect harmony with the other parts of Western Europe that each had their barbarian identity, the Ostrogoths in Italy, the Franks in, in France, et cetera, et cetera. But then 7-Eleven happened, right? It's almost like 9-Eleven happened. It's a big watershed, okay? 7-Eleven that year brought Muslims into Spain and within a few years, they had conquered most of the peninsula and they didn't go away completely until 1492, right? That's a long, long time. From Sanchez Arbenos' traditional perspective, the core of Spain, as he called it, Hispania, which is the old Roman word for Spain, um, where we get Hispanic, et cetera, Hispania's core identity was fully fashioned by the Romans and by the Visigoths before the year 600, let's say, and that it was basically an independent kingdom with, with, with Roman roots that was Catholic, very much like France, Italy, et cetera. But Spain's trajectory is diverted by the Muslim conquest, which led to Northern Spain, essentially, which was left in Christian hands to have to serve as a kind of a shield for the rest of Europe. They saw themselves, in other words, looking back on the past as playing a kind of a sacrificial martyrial role. Oh, look at us. We had to defend the rest of the Europe with the help of the Pyrenees, okay, from the attack from uh, the Muslims um, across the Straits in Africa. And so that was part of the story. And the other part of the story was that the northern Christian Spain, from that point on, from the very beginning, had to embark on a century-long reconquest of Spain in order to conquer it for the Christians. Again, this is a story that Sancho Sovernov is telling about Spanish history, okay? And it tells us more really about Sancho Sovernov and his generation than it tells us about Spanish history. Because he goes on to say that because Spain was the only part of Europe subjected to Muslim rule, and because they had to fight to get it back, that meant that Spain would develop an overactive military and an underdeveloped middle class, underdeveloped trade, banking, et cetera. It would also develop an overactive Catholic identity that would ultimately make them very hard on subject Christians, on subject Jews and Muslims, excuse me. And then finally, he made the point that the conquest of the new world was essentially an outgrowth of that reconquest of Spain. Um, that they would end up with a world empire that everybody envied in the 16th century. But by the 17th and 18th century, it was falling apart because they didn't have the tools that most other European countries would have to keep it all together. Again, I say, this is just the story about Spanish history that he's telling. Now, Américo Castro, the one we're interested in, who came up with the idea of convivencia, rejected the idea that the Roman Visigothic essence of Spanish identity, Catholic identity, et cetera, had been perverted by Islam. As far as he was concerned, Spanish identity was built on, as he called it, the convivencia, the living together of Christians, Muslims, and Jews in the medieval period. Um, it, was, it was Spain's unusual experience of mixing of Christian, Jewish, and Muslim peoples that made Spain what it was as far as he was concerned. Now, what's interesting about this, and I, that's a very short version of his thesis, but what's interesting is that his thesis was, like Sanchez Abrano's thesis, designed to explain Spanish backwardness in the 20th century 
it's another form of that same civics lesson. In other words, Castro is also motivated to find out what, what's different about Spain in the 20th century. Let's go back in the past and figure it out. But his is a much more matter-of-fact approach to Jewish and Islamic integration into Islamic into Spanish society. If it's anti-Semitic, it's very subtly anti-Semitic and and uh, and and nothing like the others. And and the fact that people reacted to his thesis as vociferously as they did among the Spanish intellectuals means that they understood him as basically saying that Spanish identity is. It means nothing if you don't talk about Christians, Muslims, and Jews interacting with one another in this period, because you don't get that in other parts of Europe. Um, anyway, because Castro, like Sanchez Albernoz, they both ended up in exile because Franco, um, basically, the intellectuals left Spain, and they were both on the on the left side of things, even though one wouldn't think about it, given how different they they are in their perspectives. But both of them ended up in different places. Um, Sanchez Albernoz ended up mostly in Argentina, but Castro ended up going to the U.S. and he taught at the University of Texas. He was a proud Longhorn for a while. He went to uh, Wisconsin. He was a Badger. And then finally he went to Princeton in the fair state of New Jersey. And he influenced a whole generation of Anglophone scholars, that is, scholars who were studying Spanish history, but they were doing it in English. One of them was a guy named Samuel Armistead, who died not too long ago, about nine years ago, um, at a ripe old age. And he was a longtime friend of the Menocal family in Cuba, um, with Maria Rosa Menocal's father in particular, who was a significant figure. Um, and he ended up, Samuel Armistead did, ended up becoming kind of a mentor to Maria Rosa Menocal, who died only a year before he did, but she was only 59 and he was in his 80s. Anyway, just an example to show you, she wasn't a student of his, but she was kind of a student of his. In other words, she didn't go to study with him, but but he had, he left his influence. And so Castro's views through people like Menocal um, spread throughout America in the US, but they didn't really make much impact on Spain where much more conservative views held sway. In the post um, Castro world, he died in 72, okay. Convivencia as a concept begins to kind of take on a life of its own thanks to these really big changes in Spain and Europe in the late 20th century. So for one thing, um, and I remember when all this happened because I was just beginning to travel to Spain in 1982, but Spain was integrated into Europe. Um, Spain was no longer an exception to Europe. It was now a part of Europe. So it entered NATO in 1982. It became part of the European Union four years later. And then it was part of the Eurozone when they launched the Euro in 2002, okay, which, which messed with all of our minds when we were used to Spanish pesetas, the way it did for everybody else. So that's one thing. So if Spain, in other words, is a part of Europe and it's no longer clear that it's different, and with all the investment from joining the, the EU, all of the trains, all of the infrastructure, I mean, Spain was turned into just the most modern example of European infrastructures you can imagine. Basically, people shrugged and said, I don't really understand why people were so worried 50 years ago about why we we're so far behind. You know, we're, we're right where we need to be, right? And so that whole thing that motivated scholars in the late 19th, early 20th century just dropped away. It was gone. And nobody was really asking those questions anymore. Um, I mean, it was remarkable how quickly that disappeared. But the other thing about Europe at that time not just about Spain joining Europe, but Europe itself was becoming increasingly multicultural, right? There's immigration all over the place, right? You think about the Turks in Germany and the guest worker programs, people coming from Africa, people coming from, from all over the Muslim world. Um, it was increasingly multicultural. And so convivencia began to be reconceptualized as a way of highlighting the fact that Spain in the pre-modern period had its own form of multiculturalism, right? And the, and the tolerance of difference that must have come with it, right? Um, so finally, people of that inclination who kind of see Spain as a, as a pre-modern tolerant, um, you know, multicultural Europe begin to write the Muslims and Jews into Iberian history instead of out of Iberian history. Um, in other words, these people of this type would see nothing inherently Christian about Spain. And this became a real antidote to a number of things that characterized Spain in the middle of the 20th century. One was, was Franco, 
whose national Catholicism, which was a an ideology that combined nationalism for, in favor of Spain with its Catholicism, led to an increased disillusion with Catholicism in Spain. And to this day, um, it's, it's, it's been difficult to bring that back, right? Um, churches, for the most part, are empty um, there as, as elsewhere. But a lot of it has to do with that dissolution. There's even a revival since the 80s of Islam in Spain, not by people who are Muslims, let's say by birth, but people who convert to Islam saying, I want nothing to do with Franco and Catholicism. I bet in my blood, I have Muslim blood too. I'm going to convert to Islam. And the so-called neo-Muslim movement uh, from that period on is quite fascinating as well. The other thing that, that um, thinking about Spain in this positive sort of multicultural tolerant way, both, both today, but then grounding that in the past, was that it had a lot to do with the way that with the Jews imagined their history. So generally speaking, when you think about Jewish history, the first thing that probably comes to mind is, is the Holocaust um, and the effect of modern mid 20th century politics on the Ashkenazi Jewish experience in Eastern Europe. But the Sephardic Jewish experience, which refers, comes from the term Sephardic, which has to do with, with Spain. It's a, like the word Al-Andalus, it basically means Spain. The experience of Jews in Spain was imagined as a happy exception to the experience of Jews in Eastern Europe, even though the Jews were kicked out of Spain in 1492, long before the famous problems of Jews in Eastern Europe began. Okay, so the tendency had been on the part of many scholars framed by the Ashkenazi Jewish experience to say, Jewish history is just one terrible thing after the next, so-called lacrimose, uh, referring to tears, the lacrimose interpretation of Jewish history. The one bright spot in that was the Sephardic Jewish experience. Think about Samuel Hanagi, think about Hastai Ibn Shaprut working for the Muslim government and enjoying incredible influence and wealth, et cetera. That was something that made, that made Jews smile collectively, right? It was that one moment. The other thing in this period too, aside from you know, rejecting the Catholic heritage and, and maybe, maybe using the Spanish Jewish experience to, to have a different sense of what, what is possible with Jews living uh, in a, in a non-Jewish world, was also that you know, the European views of Muslims that have been framed by, by British colonization of the Middle East, right, that, that if you could imagine a time when the Muslims were in charge and they treated Christians and Jews well, then, then, then you fast forward to the 19th and 20th century where, where the Jews are essentially surrogates for European domination of the, of the Eastern Mediterranean and the suppression of the Palestinians. You can imagine too, that this played similarly to the idea of Sephardic Jews having a different experience than Jews elsewhere. Here, the, the Muslims were far from, from being you know, intolerant, et cetera, they were being presented as being super tolerant. And this was a real corrective to the idea that emerged out of the whole colonial world, the post-colonial world of Islam versus the West. The Iranian revolution in 1979, okay, when I, when I um, graduated as an undergraduate, 9-11, um, which happened um, almost exactly 21 years ago, okay. Um, Samuel Huntington and his famous Clash of the Civilization essay, which became a book. These were all, these were events and thoughts that made people think that there were irreconcilable differences between the West, whatever that meant, and Islam, which was not to be a part of the West. But if you look at medieval Spain, it could become a kind of a laboratory for thinking about Islam differently in a different context and imagining these traditions getting along under the aegis of Islam. They were the ones in charge and they were the ones whose quote unquote tolerant society allowed things to happen, right? So medieval Spain essentially became a test case for Islamic based tolerance of difference. Uh, and that also was a very powerful kind of a story that people would tell now in the 21st century about medieval Spain. Notice as nice as this sounds, this is still a civics lesson more than a history lesson, right? It's still talking about convivencia episodes from the past that are used to explain a modern reality, okay? Um, 
The difference is the modern reality that we're trying to explain is a modern reality that probably most of the people sitting in this room and potentially listening to this particular recording are going to agree um, is a positive thing to imagine. In other words, people getting along in this world um, to have a kind of a multicultural society where you're not presupposing things or not putting people into categories, et cetera. Wouldn't it be nice you know, to imagine a society kind of like the way we tell the story of medieval Spain now. Again, it's a, it's a warm and fuzzy story that has some grounding in reality, but, but the question is how much, right? What's interesting too about this, notice that I mentioned that Spanish exceptionalism goes away. Spain is fully integrated into Europe. However, there's a new exception to Spain where it's being presented as the only really multicultural part of Europe in the Middle Ages although there were Christians and Jews living all over, but there weren't Muslims. And so the three of them together, that made Spain the most pluralistic society. But now suddenly being different and out of step from Europe is a positive thing, right? So Menocal's book, when you look at it, is a prime example of this new civics lesson approach to Spanish history. And it's embraced by socialists in Spain, Felipe Gonzalez and Pedro Sanchez, who's now the, the current socialist um, prime minister, as far as they're concerned, they talk about the convivency of modern Spain. Uh, in fact, Sanchez responded to Trump at one time and basically said, Spain accepts diversity as an asset. We are an inclusive country. And he's directly, implicitly tapping into convivencia stories about Spanish past, right? Um, but this whole thing, while accepted by the socialists, is poo-pooed by, rejected by the conservatives, Jose Maria Asnar and Mariano Rajoy are the last two conservative prime ministers. And they laugh at this and they say, oh, you gotta be kidding me. Um, you know, we're talking about the middle ages as being a tolerant society. I don't think so, okay? So that then leads, if we're, if we're at that kind of political boom, 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 and we're wondering, you know, what's the truth behind this, right? What have scholars said that allows us to say something with confidence about convivencia as a historical fact, rather than just a new story that we like to tell about the past or a story that we reject about the past if, if we're looking at it from conservative eyes. So the fundamental fact is this, of all the regions in medieval Western Europe, okay, Spain was the one that was characterized by the most religious pluralism for the longest period of time, not just Christians and Jews, which you get all throughout Europe, but Christians, Jews, and Muslims. That's not to say that Eastern Europe was any less diverse, maybe more so you, places like Hungary, et cetera. If you think about the Balkans, I mean, it's, but I'm talking really about, about the West. I'm talking about areas that would traditionally be Latin uh, reading areas, okay, as opposed to Greek or, or Arabic. Spain is the only part of Latin Europe to become part of what we call the Dar al Islam, which means the, the House of Islam, as opposed to the House of War, which is the areas that are not under Muslim rule. Um, and that's all during this, uh, this initial expansion period from the time of Muhammad's death in 632, 100 years later, 732, when Charlemagne's grandfather, Charles Martel, beats the Muslims supposedly at the, at the Loire River and confines them to Spain, and they're not going to take over the rest of Europe. So the only part of early medieval Europe with significant number of Muslims and the only part, this is very important, of early medieval Europe that's ruled by Muslims, that's Spain, okay? And that means it's the only part of Europe with subject Christians as well as subject Jews. In other words, Christians and Jews who do not have political authority outside of their own communities. They do not have, they're, they're operating within a host society, if you want to use an anthropological term. So what are some more modern scholars say about this, ones who are somewhat skeptical about the whole, you know, uh, mental call sort of civics lesson thing, right? The most important of them is also the earliest one, a friend of mine named Thomas Glick, um, Boston University, now retired. His whole approach was an anthropological approach. As far as he was concerned, convivencia is not something that anybody really planned for or wanted to achieve but it was basically a form of where you're forced to live with people who are different from you and nobody has enough power to do anything about it, okay? So it's sort of the dark view of convivencia. Christians, Muslims, and Jews all in Spain and, and the Muslims don't have enough power to convert everybody to Islam or to kick them out. So they let them stay, they pay taxes, they try to leave them alone, et cetera. 
He said, at best, this is a modus vivendi. It's not an end of the values of either Christian or Muslims. In other words, Christians in power with power might want it all to be Christian. Muslims in power with power might want it all to be Islam, but they didn't have that choice. And so they dealt with it, okay? He said, it's a stage of arrested fusion or incomplete assimilation and that it was inherently unstable. And therefore it was inevitable at the end when one group, in this case, the Christians got enough power that it would be over with in a flash, the hostility, the assimilation, and finally the expulsion of the minority by the dominant culture, as he writes, that's what characterizes late 15th and 16th century Spain. As far as he's concerned, medieval Spain, though, before that period, especially under Muslim rule, is like a laboratory for applying anthropological theories that offer a whole range of contact situations. In other words, Christians ruling Muslims, Muslims ruling Christians, Jews working for, for Muslims. I mean, it's like, like a laboratory where you get to change all the controls, right? That's, that's what he liked about it. And there was no other place in Europe that allowed him to use his anthropological tools as well in the Middle Ages, right? Um, he recognized that there were very destructive moments, but there are also profoundly constructive ones. That's precisely when the political forces were more or less equal between the, the Christians and the Muslims and the Jews took advantage of the fact that many Muslims were suspicious of Muslims and many Christians were suspicious of Christians. And so they would hire Jews to do some of their work for them. And those kinds of, of pragmatic situations allowed for the occasional flowering, the occasional convivencia moment that we write about and, and read about and, and embrace and think, isn't that wonderful? So his critique of some of the flowery views of convivencia, at one point he wrote, the communal autonomy of these groups, and he meant the subject Christians and Muslims under, uh, Jews under Muslim rule. He said the communal autonomy of these groups that's often represented as a very symbol of tolerance was in fact the institutional expression of ethnocentric norms, which held such groups in abhorrence as tolerated but alien citizens who were not to share in social life on the same basis as members of the dominant religion. Part of this, and he goes on to explain this, is because when the Muslims arrived, there were relatively few. They may have been in power, but they weren't demographically dominant. And so they found themselves, not only that, but Islam was so new, it had not fully formed in some ways. And so they had to protect themselves from the subject community. So by setting up these autonomous communities of Christians and Jews and told them, just pay taxes and, and we'll leave you alone, they actually allowed themselves some space to develop their own Islamic theology and, and culture in isolation, more or less, while sometimes interacting with Christians and Jews. Um, his view was that convivency is a salvageable concept, but it needs a new lease on life. It needs to be placed in what he calls a modern anthropological theoretical framework um, so that people can understand things like assimilation, acculturation, et cetera. And then people will really be able to understand it. And the article that he and an Israeli by the name of Pisanyer wrote in 1969 is still one of the best things you can read about, about convivencia. And most of, of what has happened really since, as I believe, just been unfolding that really, really incredible article. Another, and these I'll handle much more, much more briefly, Mark Meyerson, who's at Toronto and a friend of mine, um, he's all about the economics of convivencia. And so he goes into the late medieval period when, when the Jews are supposed to be under the gun. And he realizes that in fact, there's a lot going on there because there's a lot of economic mutual independence or, or dependence, I should say, interdependence. And so apart from categories of religious and cultural difference, people trade and they interact. You know, you, you go to the butcher store that offers you the best and cleanest meat, if, whether it's halal kosher or, or Christian, you know, that, that's what people do. Um, there's an old expression in, in Latin, the pecunia non olet, meaning money doesn't smell. In other words, if the customer comes in and gives you money, if you're a, a, a good merchant, you know, you don't care where that person comes from, what language they speak, what religion they are, et cetera. And that's Meyerson's real thesis. David Nuremberg, who um, is now living in New Jersey because he's the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, he was a graduate student when I was at the Institute for Advanced Study many years ago. So it's a long connection there too. But he had a really remarkable thesis that he wrote that became his first book and is really what propelled him all the way through to Rice, to Chicago, and now to the Institute. And that is this idea that um, 
convivencia doesn't mean that there's no violence, okay? All it means is people are living together, right? It doesn't mean they're necessarily getting along, okay? There are moments when everybody's getting along, but there's also moments when they aren't. And he goes so far as to say, in fact, some violence is necessary and is an inherent aspect of convivencia. It's kind of a dialectical approach. This is what he says. Convivencia rests upon the notion that toleration was predicated on intolerance. That is, not only were ritualized outbursts of intercommunal violence a normal and expected part of coexistence, but also they made the continued toleration for non-Christian minorities possible by delineating their place within majority society. Now, he's writing about the later period when the Christians are in charge, but his point is that if you occasionally give people the opportunity to kind of act in a violent way, traditionally or typically in a ritualized violent way. So Christians would gather around a Jewish quarter and they would throw pebbles at the wall of the quarter, okay? And they do that once a year. And if it was understood, that's what they were going to do. And somehow it made it possible for 364 days of the year for the Christians and Jews to get along. It's a really interesting, again, anthropologically driven kind of study. Brian Katlos from University of Colorado is about to host a conference here or be at a conference at UCLA that I'll be at. He takes the word convivencia and he says, let's not say convivencia as in living together. Let's say conveniencia, meaning convenience, okay? Um, and you can kind of see where this fits in terms of the previous ones. He says, it's not about acculturation. That is what Glick says. It's not about endemic violence, what Nuremberg says. Instead, and I quote, the fabric of interfaith relations was held together by a system of overlapping reciprocal interests and negotiated utilitarian arrangements, which he termed conveniencia. In other words, which he terms that. In other words, religious coexistence was not a romantic affair, but a marriage of convenience predicated on utility, which could be torn asunder under the double pressure of economic and social insecurity and growing competition, which I don't see as hugely different from Glick. But but the in, but the coining of the term conveni con it's hard to say conveniencia convenience is is interesting, and then Maya Soifer, who's uh, currently at Rice, she has a position that some time ago um, Nuremberg had. She wrote a really interesting article relatively recently, saying, "Is there really anything all that exceptional except, exceptional about medieval Islamic toleration? Because if you think about it, the Christians in the north." also had similar legal structures in place protecting their Jewish populations, which were considered kind of like silos with autonomous um, authority. It's just there were times, of course, when those silos sort of broke down and, and there was violence, but that was also true sometimes in Spain as well. So basically, he, she wonders whether or not we're making too much out of Spain. It may have three peoples instead of two, but there's one in charge and there's at least one under their thumb um, is it all that different? She went on to wonder whether Christian kings in Spain dealt with their Muslim and Jewish subjects differently than Northern Christian kings dealt with their Jewish subjects, right? Um, and then she wondered too, we normally think of the kind of making of a persecuting society as growing out of Northern Europe, but, but she wonders whether Spain was exempt from that or was it really a part of that? It's a very interesting article. Remy Constable and, and, and Jonathan Ray, she uh, used to be at Notre Dame before she died, way too young of cancer. Um, and uh, and uh, Jonathan Ray, who's, who's doing well at Georgetown. Um, and then myself, I would kind of throw myself in this category too. And that is, the, we focus more on convivencia from the perspective of the actual participants in it, okay? In other words, um, what were people at the time thinking about, about convivencia? And most of them, most of them were thinking about it, if they were thinking about it at all, were thinking about it as a threat to the social cohesion of their religious communities, whether Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. In other words, the more Muslims and Jews spend time together, the more Christians and Muslims spend time together, Jews and Christians spend time together, the more their kids play together, the more they go to the same stores and butcher shops, the more they they gather, you know, to celebrate each other's holidays because it's fun, you know, as long as you've got, you know, hot dogs or carne asada, does it really matter what you're celebrating, right? And so people would gather and they would celebrate 
And it was the boundary keepers, the priests, the rabbis, and the imams who would say, what do you think you're doing? You, you can't play with those kids next door. Okay? You can't shop at that butcher shop. Okay, but but the meat's better there. No, 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 no. You don't get it. Okay, you are you are corrupting yourself by doing that, right? Boundaries, 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 right? And so, essentially, um, what Menel Call and others seem to be rooting for these little examples of religious harmony and exchange and tolerance, et cetera, is absolutely antithetical to what the boundary keepers want, right? They want firm lines. They want you staying within your lanes. So in other words, someone who is a convivencia fan like Menokal is really highlighting those moments when there's a real breakdown in communal boundary maintenance. And that communal boundary maintenance is in the hand of the professional exponents of each of those religions, right? So it's the priest, it's the rabbi, and it's the imam. So getting back to 1492 and kind of wrapping this up, okay, um, the, the surrender of Granada and the expulsion of the Jews as the end of, of convivencia. Another way to look at it might be that 1492 and 1502, when the Muslims were expelled too, kind of an extension of 1492, that instead of being the end of convivencia, it might actually be kind of the, cul the culmination of convivencia in another weird way. Um, I'm not saying it's a good idea to expel populations, but follow my logic here, right? So the expulsions of the Jews and later the Muslims were limited to those Jews and Muslims who refused to convert to Christianity. Anybody who converted to Christianity was allowed to stay. And most did convert and most remained. And that led to a new, highly intensified phase of convivencia. If you think about what it means suddenly as a Jew or a Muslim to reject your religious identity and now have to learn a new one, right? But at the same time, it meant there was nothing legally standing in the way for a Jew or a Muslim to rise in Christian civil society. And it caused quite a bit of consternation. The so-called new Christians um, uh, who used to be Jews or whose parents or grandparents used to be Jews, suddenly they found themselves in positions of authority that they could have never legally had before. And what did this lead to? It led to jealousy. And that jealousy ultimately led to the Inquisition, to people uh, accusing them of remaining secret Jews or secret Muslims, and ultimately the Jews and Muslims are expelled so that the, the church in Spain and the royal authorities in Spain can convince themselves that everyone left in Spain, once the Jews and Muslims have been kicked out, regardless of their heritage, should all be Christian, and therefore the, the Inquisition would have jurisdiction over them all. I know that doesn't sound like a convivencia moment that's antithetical to what Menocal is talking about. But in a way, when you imagine whether, whether the, the reasons for conversion are, are, are because you want to convert or more likely because you're forced to convert by circumstance, you don't want to leave your home, you don't want your kids to have to grow up in a whole different area, um, that in some ways this leads to an even deeper interpenetration, a forced interpenetration or convivencia of these cultures. And it takes a long time for those differences to work out. Um, anyway, as in other words, essentially completely erasing the lines between the different traditions, okay, ultimately leads to conversion. And that might be the ultimate expression of convivencia, which might, by the way, lead us then back to Glick and his original ideas. Um, I mean, one could, one could argue, although I haven't done it before this talk right now, that conversion is both the logical extension of convivencia and its logical end, because once everybody's converted the same tradition, there's no more interacting between traditions, even though there's a lot to work out within the tradition. It becomes a big intramural conversation. Um, without something preventing conversion, convivencia essentially has a built-in expiration date. And that gets us back to Glick. It's at best a modus vivendi. Uh, it's not an end of values of, of either the Christians or the Muslims. It's a stage of arrested fusion or complete incomplete assimilation, which is not to say, and this is a nod to Menachal, that some incredible things didn't happen. When, when Samuel Hanagid says, I am the David of my age because I'm leading Muslim armies against other Muslim armies and I'm a Jew, 
that's that's he must have lied awake at night wondering what in the heck is going on that I should be in this particular position. So things line up, really cool things happen that we can talk about, read about, and students get really excited about it, turns out. Um, but, but we don't expect any one of these things, given human nature and given the desire to define yourselves as one group against other groups, we don't expect these things to last when there's no political balance to kind of keep them in check. And that's pretty much all I have to say about that. <laughs> but I'm open for questions if this is an appropriate thing to, uh, to do. Um, and I noticed I should uh, shout out to Laura there. I believe we know one another. Is that true, Laura? Did I get a thumbs up or something? Yes, it from is you? true. What a <laughs> wonderful lecture. Thank you for letting me sit in. I'm glad I passed across again. Thank you. Well, you, you, should, you should reach out independently and, and, uh, and let's chat, okay? Will do. Thank okay. you. Okay. So anyway, um, questions. Any questions you might have, I'm, I'm delighted to, to try to answer them. Uh, Candy, do you? I mean, I don't. I don't really have a question, but I guess just a confirmation. Um, when you're talking about uh, the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims living together in medieval Spain, this was a time where religion was their culture, right? So, because today it's it's their culture, but there's other things too yeah. that define culture. Is that that's correct? Such a, that's such a, a great question. Um, Glick actually, in a later book that he wrote, um, has a whole chapter on ethnicity. Um, and his premise is that ethnicity in, in midi through medieval eyes is based primarily on religious affiliation. And yet that's not all of it, right? So Muslims famously regarded Muhammad's message as being one of egalitarianism that way. And, and you, were, you were being judged by God, et cetera, et cetera. But when they expanded into non-Arabic speaking areas and found themselves, for instance, dealing with Berbers in, uh, in North Africa and the Alice Mountain regions, um, they couldn't resist um, um, describing them as being essentially poor Muslims because their Arabic wasn't as good, because they didn't quite have the, the rituals down correctly, et cetera. So a lot, of, a lot of ethnic difference gets expressed through the idea that you're somewhat a religiously heterodox, that you're not quite on the same page. And that's, and that's a way, of, a way of, um, of putting it all under the blanket of religion, even though we know that it was much bigger than that, that it was cultural as well. Um, also, I would mention too, um, uh, uh, Remy Constable, who, who passed away her, her last book, which came out posthumously, um, she had only about half finished it, but then uh, one of the people that she worked with um, actually took over and in the last years of her life, uh, last months of her life and then beyond, he made, he finished it. But it's a book called um, To Live Like a Moor. And it focuses on <coughs> a mudejar. That means a Muslim who under pressure of expulsion typically converts to Christianity, but they retain some kind of identity, pre-Muslim identity within the Christian world that they're operating in. So Granada, as you can imagine, would be filled with people like that. This one that she focused on, a guy by the name of, his last name was double last name, Nunez Moulay. He was born around the year 1490 in this elite Muslim family in Granada. And then very shortly after, okay, Granada falls when he's two, let's say, and when he's 12, that's when the Muslims are kicked out. So he and his family presumably convert to Christianity. Um, and he ends up being employed uh, shortly thereafter, about 1500, 1502, by the household of the Archbishop of Granada. Later on, at age 80, one, two, skip a few, okay, mm -hmm. he writes a memorandum to the city's chief administrator in Granada, basically saying, in response to um, a, a law in 1567 prohibiting certain behaviors that are considered to be too Muslim, even though it's now a fully Christian city because the Muslims have been kicked out. But remember, a lot of Muslims converted to Christianity, right? And mm -hmm. understandably, they have with them cultural practices, their foods and the way they dress and the way they talk and everything. Anyway, a lot of these were in 1567 outlawed by the city of Granada, by the city fathers, let's say. Um, 
And so he writes a memorandum as a cranky old man, you know, when I'm old, I'll wear purple, you know, and, mm. and, and it's, it's wonderful that this, this has survived. And he basically says, there's a whole set of custom visiting bathhouses, wearing a particular dress, using a particular style of name, um, having Arabic books, singing traditional songs, all of these things that had been prohibited by the Christian authorities, he argued, are cultural, not religious. It's a very interesting and sophisticated argument, right, um, that he offers up and says, and, and you can kind of see it, you see this in the, in the, in the Inquisition too, which is aimed initially at former uh, Jewish families that had been converted to Christianity. And they wanted to make sure they were good, they were good uh, Christians. And so they would ask them questions about, you know, do you eat pork? Um, and of course, if you said yes, and you know, you bit into a ham sandwich, that was probably good for you under those circumstances, because the Inquisition is looking for signs of you being a compliant Christian. But what if you don't like pork? You know, what if your family never used pork recipes? What if they always thought the meat was dirty, right? So the fact that you can eat it now because you're a Christian doesn't make you necessarily want to just go off and get a pork chop, right? Mm -hmm. and so, And so the, the end result is there are inquisitors asking Jews about things that, as you point out so well, Candy, are not specifically religious, but they're looking for markers, right? They're looking for things that they can't look into a person's mind. So so they ask, are they working on Sunday? You know, are they working on Saturday? You know, what, what's their holy day based on their behavior? You know, and it may be that you have a job that, that, that requires that you work through Sunday, right? And, and you've always had that job, and, but then it becomes, it becomes something that can be held against you. So huge yeah. long answer to your question, but it was such a good question, it deserved it, so. Yeah, I, I wonder if there's any literature related to the amalgamation of those cultures after people converted because i could imagine that was quite interesting to to witness um cultures coming together i'm sure people took on other people's traditions and that yep. must be must have been interesting you get a lot with cookbooks you see you see cookbooks that people have uh, there was a person here years ago who was um applying for a deanship who studied who studied cooking uh, in Spain that way and, and tried to trace those kinds of recipes. So um, that's that's one possibility, right? But it but it's everything, right? Mm -hmm. Regulations about bathhouses uh, also, that's really interesting. Um, and, and when that became a problem. Um, that the place to start though is really with Constable's book to live like a more um, highly recommended, not very old because uh, and it really came out maybe five years ago, I think, maybe a little longer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Therese, did you have a question before? Well, actually, it kind of um, maybe builds on this or, or is related to it in some way, but I was interested in, in hearing more about what happened with the converted folks after, because it seems like that's not a stable situation either, because they've been kind of um, declassed. And I know in just from, um, I don't know very much, but, um, but I, but I was reading about um, Teresa of Avila having, um, like being part of the Conversos community because of her father, grandfather, mm -hmm. and St. John of the Cross, and some of these folks who went off and founded wow. their own um, yep. religious institutions that were ca Catholic, but they, they were supported by like the conversos in the area like the, the yeah. there there is there is work done on that the early modern period is a great period for working on those things um you know the in the the new world they try to guarantee that no um people without as they call it clean blood which which uh limpieza de sangre right um was was something that that really um once once when you think about, say, 1391 or so, there were pogroms in Spain, attacks against Jewish communities that led to large numbers of Jews being forcibly converted to Christianity, forcibly baptized. Unfortunately, the way Christianity works is once you're baptized, you're baptized, you can't rub it off, okay? And so these people were expected to live the rest of their lives as Christians. Um, the advantage to them, even if they didn't want to be Christian, was they could marry into Christian families. And some of those Christian families were noble families that had no money. 
and some of the formerly Jewish families had money. And so there's a marriage of convenience between them. And they often found themselves at the highest levels um, in positions of authority in different cities in the late 15th century and 16th century, which is one of the reasons why the Inquisition, why, why people so kind of eagerly participated with it if they, could, if they could denounce people, right? Because there was real economic competition going on. And one real way of identifying and controlling Jews was taken away because now they're all technically Christians. That's really what, what fuels the Inquisition. It's such a perverse and twisted idea, but, but it had no jurisdiction over Jews. The Inquisition only had jurisdiction over Christians of Jewish ancestry um, who might have retained Jewish customs. And they had to figure that out based on behavior because no one was going to typically admit to you know, not uh, believing in Jesus, et cetera, but, but they might well admit to carrying a menorah around under their coat or something equivalent to that, or the kind of foods that they eat. They, aha, that's Jewish, is it really? I didn't know that. Um, it, it gets super complicated. I mean, Columbus himself, there are theories that he was from a converso family, and that may be why um, he essentially grew up in Genoa, even though he was a Spanish background, that he might have had to leave um, in, in order to avoid the kinds of suspicions, you know, the Inquisition begins about uh, 1479, 1480, you know, so you can kind of do the arithmetic and his family could have been pushed out and et cetera. So they wanted to keep Jews and Muslims and all conversos out of the new world. That did not work at all. And so the Inquisition was then moved to the new world. And it was just a big colossal mess that if, it, if the only positive thing it probably did was keep thousands of people employed because there was just all the record keeping and, and, and cross-checking to make sure people had, hadn't given false testimony. You know, this was the great um, contribution, quote unquote, of the Inquisition to modern totalitarian uh, governments and societies. They kept records and they read those records. And it also, of course, becomes an incredible source for social history. I have a student right now, an undergraduate, who was working on the early years of the Inquisition and uh, doing some really wonderful work recreating some of the people who are up, uh, who are in the crosshairs. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a mess and it gets harder and harder to, um, um, once everybody's technically Christian, then, and you've got the Inquisition doing their thing, um, um, they say that some of the, some of the most vociferous um, um, supporters of the Inquisition were in some cases Jewish families who were really worried about their own fate in front of the Inquisition. So you can become an accuser to kind of um, to kind of uh, you know divert some attention, and that's potentially part of this story too. So it's it's a mess, and it and it tears community apart, tears families apart. You know, it's it, expelling the Jews, expelling the Muslims. The the laments both of the Jews and the and the Muslims regard in some ways Spain as a lost paradise. Um, it's the it's the second promised land for the Jews and for the Muslims. It's Al Andalus, you know, and even uh, um, Osama bin Laden, you know, referred to the great insult of of um, of the Christians having taken back Al Andalus, which was such a gem as far as the Muslim world was concerned, at least in retrospect, right? So there's there's all of this kind of um, uh, storytelling going on about the past to support these different positions. I have not been looking at the chat at all, so if there's anything in the chat, just um, let me know, but I put a few things in the chat as you were talking. I tried to. Oh, um, good. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's nice. Nicely done. Not, you know, <laughs> yeah. might be. Yeah. Might be too much, <laughs> but yeah. um. It's really it's a, a very um, fertile subject. There's plenty of room for for people to do good and creative work within it, um, both in the medieval period and the period really that you guys are entering into, um, from 1450 on. I mean, that's the period of the unification of of Spain, not Portugal, but Spain. And it's the period of the Inquisition, the expulsions, Columbus. I mean, the 15th century is just a, um, a roller coaster. Can you, there was kind of, I mean, just 
I know we're kind of, uh, we're at about, you know, quarter after eight now, um, but I don't know whether, um, whether it's easy to extend it this way, but I was also interested in, I mean, Sicily seems to have been such a crossroads and it brought a lot of Islamic culture into Italy in, in a way, you know, and um, where does that fit in? Yeah. You know, with also, this also a great question. And I, I, you know, I trim some, I trim some branches. I pruned my subject. Okay. And, and when I said that Spain was the only part of Western Europe to fall under the initial expansion, that's basically true because um, Sicily was not pulled into the Islamic world until a little bit later. And it had to do with um, Muslim dynasty in uh, Tunisia, Ifriqiya, as they called it, um, adopting the Roma word Africa, which referred only basically to Tunisia and then was extended like Asia Minor to all of Asia and Africa to all of Africa. But um, the, um, so it fell to the Aglubids who were based in, in Tunisia and it became a, it became a, a Muslim area, right? Um, the problem with Sicily, we, we assume that everything that we see going on in Spain is going on there too, to some degree. The problem is the sources are not fantastic. Um, and so most people who study multiculturalism, et cetera, end up going to Spain because it's a longer period of time. In Sicily, it's basically from the 840s until about the year 1090 when uh, Norman groups take over and, and now the Muslims are for a while a subject population there. So it's not really that long. And the sources, the sources can be tough. There, there are certain types of sources, legal sources that you can use, but doesn't have the texture of the Spanish sources. That is medieval sources in general are, are potluck. You never know what you're gonna get, but Spain um, offers a lot more a lot more dishes, shall we say, than uh, than Sicily does, but it but but it, it follows a similar kind of a pattern, and just as, for instance, um, Alfonso the Tenth of Castile, uh, who ruled in the later part of the 13th century, imagined himself as the the emperor of three religions, very proud of the fact that his father uh, Fernando. Um, uh, the king of Spain and, and a saint, cousin of, of St. Louis, the saint of Missouri. Anyway, um, he, um, he is very proud of the fact that he uh, controlled territory that had large numbers of, of Muslim and, and Jewish subjects in it because his father had conquered quite a bit of Southern Spain at that time, all but Granada, at least the portion that was allotted to, to the people, to Castile. Um, but he regarded himself as the emperor of three religions and and when he died, his, you know, his tomb has all three ins his inscriptions from all the languages. And that's another one of the convivencia moments that, that come out in the later part of, of Menocal's book. Um, on the other side, Frederick II, who was a Hohenstaufen uh, emperor, um, but a king of Germany first, his mother um, was the last heir of the Norman rulers of Sicily who had taken away from the Muslims. And so he regarded himself as being both the king of the so-called two Sicilies, meaning Southern Italy and Sicily, as well as the king of Germany. And so um, he was somebody who also styled himself to be a cosmopolitan ruler of all these different traditions. He had a, a very lavish court. He lived in Palermo. That was his choice as opposed to Germany. You know, who could, who could fault him for that, you know, in, in uh, any way that, um, the fact that they are basically doing that exactly the same time, Alfonso the Tenth in Spain and and Fernando the, or excuse me, um, uh, Frederick the Second in uh, in Germany, um, and both of them are doing it on the basis of having as part of their territory a multicultural component is really interesting, and both regarding themselves and using that as something that I'm I'm such a cosmopolitan ruler that I also rule essentially Muslim territory was was a selling point. Yeah, I was amazed at, um, at, at Frederick II because um, there was some kind of line being drawn from his court at Palermo to, um, to even to Petrarch's uh, sonnets and, and, mm -hmm. and Boccaccio and, and what was happening in Florence a little bit later. Um, yeah, and the fact that he would actually go on crusade without the Pope's permission and negotiate 
a temporary surrender of, of Jerusalem and have himself crowned king of Jerusalem and marry the, the daughter of the titular king of Jerusalem. I mean, he was, he was a wild man um, and was very, very much tied up in the Muslim world that way. And, you know, people didn't really see it that way. I mean, they, they really regarded the Mediterranean as being kind of anybody's game. And so you allied with whomever you allied with in order to get the job done. I mean, we could, we, if we expand this to talk about the Mediterranean, we could, we could go on forever, which, which, um, yeah, that's another, that's another day. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know whether anybody has any last questions or comments or I just want to thank you so much for doing well, this. It's my pleasure. I, I appreciate you reaching out. It's always a always an opportunity. Um, and I encourage people who are on this call and people who are listening um, at some point in a in a asynchronous way, uh, feel free to reach out. At the top of the handout um, is my email address, uh, and you can also learn a little bit about our late antique medieval studies program here at Pomona, which is um, quite a quite a kind of groundbreaking sort of a, a thing, and you could just check it out. That's basically a form of medieval studies modeled on classics where students either take Latin, Greek, or Arabic as their fundamental language, and they spend time doing that while they're, while they're studying, uh, you know, the kinds of things we're talking about now. And uh, it's led to a lot of really interesting opportunities. Um, students in graduate school um, were so young that I haven't seen them get a job yet, but we're going to keep our fingers crossed that um, that eventually the whole world is populated with uh, with Pomona trained uh, undergraduates who who do medieval studies based on language. So, <laughs> I think that would be a paradise. Yes, <laughs> could, it could be nice. Could be nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it's been a pleasure, and um, I wish you all the very very best as you go into this semester. Be well. Thank you. All my students, uh, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll communicate with you about how to, uh, how to claim your points or whatever over uh, Canvas, but uh, thank you so much. Very good. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye-bye.